Where's your Oh, so a lot of people. Good, good. Namisha, have you been to our <laughs> So, uh, and welcome to all the new faces I see here. This is the research center. Our park is actually over the hill. That's where we have uh, all of our vessels and our visitor center and the museum building where the Moby Dick reading will be taking place. Uh, we like to say that's the heart, but over here is the brains of the park. So welcome to the nerve center of it. Um, so this is the fourth or third talk uh, in our Moby Dick lecture series. Uh, we've had a couple talks before uh, that have dealt with things like climate change and uh, whale bodies and uh, female bodies and body autonomy. And uh, then we had the exhibition of Or the Whale, which if you have not been to our Prismatarium over at the museum building, I highly suggest stopping by and seeing that exhibit. It is a replica of the original piece, which is 51 feet long. This is a 30-foot version of Or the Whale, uh, which tells the story of uh, the history of capitalism. And uh, the artist is here tonight. Uh, but tonight, we have a totally different talk. And I am very excited about this, because when I heard about your topic, I was like, now how is this going to fit together? And that is one of my favorite places to be in in my mind, is when I'm trying to figure out, how is this all going to come together, because it's an exciting place to, to be. And so I uh, hope you are all there with me tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, who you've been <laughs> seeing. Uh, him and I talked the whole night. Uh, Sharad Shari, Shari? Shari. Shari uh, is a geographer, and he remains puzzled by geography as a form of earthly or oceanic writing. He received his PhD in geography at Berkeley in 2000, after which he was a postdoctoral fellow in anthropology and history at the Michigan Society of Fellows at the University of Michigan. He was a lecturer of human geography at the London School of Economics and an associate professor at the Center for Indian Studies in Africa and the Department of Anthropology at the University of Witterwatersrand. <laughs> well, how would you say it? Uh, it's a uh, Witwatersrand. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or WITS in South Africa. He remains affiliated to the WITS Institution for Social and Economic Research and its project on oceanic, oceanic humanities in the global south. And you're currently an associate professor at UC Berkeley, right? Yep. yep. So he's local and back. So, uh, so that's good. And uh, without further ado, let's see how the heck you tie this all together. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Gina. Is that is this fine with the mic? Thank you for that warm introduction, and thanks to Colin, thanks to everyone, thanks to everyone for being here. I should uh, give you a disclaimer that um, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a literature scholar at all, and so this, these these are really the speculation, the ravings of a um, of a of an enthusiast. But then I thought about it. That's a large part in a large part of what Moby Dick is as well. It's um, <laughs> So uh, I, I assume that I'm with um, uh, fellow travelers. Um, I also wanted to thank my dear friend Alice in the back for outfitting me with a <laughs> good evening. <laughs> All right. I, I begin by asking questions that betray some of the bluntness about race in our time. Is Ishmael, or the person who says, call me Ishmael, uh, white? What about Ahab? What do we make of the motley crew on the ship or the white whale we, they uh, pursue? As you might guess, there are no easy answers to any of these questions, if there are answers at all. I'll instead draw on a set of black critical thinkers. Uh, C.L.R. James, the uh, communist, Trinidadian communist, um, Michael Sawyer, uh, Catherine McKittrick, and artist Ellen Gallagher, who um, poses Moby Dick as an Afrofuturist work. And, and all, all these thinkers also see the centrality of a young black cabin boy, Pip, um, in, the, in the story, a seemingly marginal figure who recasts the geography of the book. A geographer's way of reading calls on all the senses to rethink how we think we know a place or an environment however transient or mobile that place or environment might be, like the environment of a ship, um, and without any certainty about where it might be headed. That's what Melville gives us in The Journey of the Pequot. When we keep uh, Pip in mind, 
a particular climax comes into view, and there are lots of spoiler alerts. This is one of them. Um, young Pip falls into the ocean, loses his mind, but gains a different kind of vision in the process, leading to the final stages of the destruction of the Pequod. Thinking alongside Pip's transformation will help us think about, I think, and I hope, what it means to read Moby Dick today. So I want to begin just by thinking about the context. Melville wrote and published Moby Dick in the context of a brief but spectacular uh, boom that made New England, by 1830, the global center of whaling. Um, New Bedford and Nantucket were at its heart. One whaling syndicate, Gideon, Allen, and Sons of New Bedford, made annual returns of 60% during this boom. It is one of the best performing firms in US economic history. Uh, New Bedford whaling capital averaged returns of 14% per year between 1817 and 1820. So this capital was incredibly concentrated and finance rushed in. Sounds familiar, right? In our backyard. Rushed into New England whaling until it began to falter and before the opening up of new frontiers of speculative investment in the California gold rush of uh, 1848-55, right in the middle of this peak. So the timing of Melville's writing and rewriting of the book, 1850 to 1851, is important. What was particularly celebrated was the venture capital at the apex. Um, the financiers with whom finance inputs and outputs in exchange for about two-thirds of the profits. The financiers had an assured share, and then they incentivized how everyone got a piece of, a little piece of the rest. And it was called the lay system. They had apportioned the remainder. Uh, for half to a third, with a captain getting a twelfth. This is called a twelfth lay. Um, in the opening pages of Moby Dick, we see these uh, highly skilled harpooners getting, uh, men of color like Queequeg, getting a 90th lay, while Ishmael gets a paltry 300th lay, lay. That's one over 300. A miserable share that has led to some speculation about whether the narrator could have been white at all. Melville never says he is. There are various clues that maybe he's not, including the rhetorical device, or the rhetorical question Ishmael asks in the very first chapter, who ain't a slave, as well as his choice of uh, name, um, the biblical Ishmael, son of the bondswoman Hagar, or Ismail and Hajar in Arabic. These are Rockwell Kent's um, drawings of Queequeg and, Is and Ishmael, Philip Hoare reads Moby Dick as their great queer love story, but their queerest moment is on shore at the beginning of the book, not you know when the ship leaves. Um, and you know we might expect, we might have expected from the opening, Queequeg, this incredibly charismatic character, to have a starring role. Margaret Cohen argues that while uh, Queequeg comes closest to the Superman of sea fiction. And the reader could imagine him galvanizing the crew to survival if only his narrator would allow him a starring role. Neither Ishmael nor Melville allow him that role. So it's a kind of failed queer romance as well. The book ends with Ishmael, the sole survivor. He survives in a coffin made by Queequeg on which the South Sea Islander has transcribed the tattoos on his body which encode the wisdom of his people. After the catastrophe, Ishmael climbs into the floating ca coffin. Yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, uh, he climbs into the floating coffin. That's also a text, the wisdom of, uh, of the indigenous of Oceania. But it's a wisdom Ishmael will never be able to read, let alone appropriate. It's a poetic ending, a caution that there's no rescue from catastrophe by indigenous knowledge either. Returning to the political economy of whaling, the other side of the system of financing of this, you know, this apex of financing was a particular structure of exploitation and cruelty, which incentivized ship captains to squeeze labor as well as a slow and steady loss of life, particularly on the return journey. Seafarers were often abandoned on the return, as on slave ships. Uh, captains also gave men exorbitant loans to garner their profit shares. Black sailors were given the worst lodgings and the least, the least food. What matters were whales, not whalers. Moby Dick, in some ways, um, is a counter history to the incredible dehumanization on the ship, chronicling a shifting period in a mobile racial capitalist hit, uh, factory of a particular kind. 
The seafarers on the peak water, of course, are motley crew, including Indian Ocean Lascars, composite term, mariners from the South Pacific thrown into another collective category, the Kanakas, Chinese, Persians, Africans, and so on. The, the name Pequot is it, itself from the uh, Native American Pequot tribe, subject to genocidal attacks by New England Puritans um, two centuries earlier. Um, their survivors forced into slavery in Barbados and Bermuda. So it's an apt name for a ship bound for destruction. This ship is also a catalog of racial types, but in many ways the characters evade stereotypes. Uh, and perhaps the primary way is that all the characters are relational. They are intertwined, interrelated figures whose archetypal qualities clarify in relation to each other. And many of the chapters unfold through juxtapositions and confrontations that further elaborate these archetypes of personhood. The notion of the collective industrial worker is also important, but in some ways it's a kind of mirage. It's a collectivity that comes together in the choreography of the labor process in chapter 40, an important chapter, Midnight Foxhole, which also shows the whaling sh ship as a Tower of Babel, a collection of workers communicating across languages, straining to identify as a collective. It's also a decidedly masculine and homoerotic space of work, as in chapter 94, a squeeze of the hand in which the men collectively squeeze the sperm while working themselves into a frenzy. The narrator interjects the division of labor in, um, in chapter 27, Knights and Squires, with a surprising claim that islanders seem to make the best whalemen and that they were nearly all islanders on the Pequod. Isolatos too. Each isolato, this is a Melville term, each isolato living on a separate continent of his own yet now federated along one keel, what a set these isolatos were. So we have a complex argument, a, a set of claims about personhood. On the one hand, a ship of isolatos, each a continent of his own. On the other hand, a hierarchized microcosm in a world of men. Gender is obviously central to all this. Importantly, about 20% of the whaling workforce between 1800 and 1860 were African Americans. This is a period in which Britain and the US had recently abolished the slave trade, 1807, while illegal trafficking continued until 1859, as did the internal trafficking um, with the expansion of cotton in the, with the Louisiana Purchase. Black whalers were often highly valued, like harpooner Dagu, um, and valued and devalued at the same time. Uh, the most Im important inventions from New Bedford whaling uh, was a harpoon tip called the Temple Toggle, invented by former slave Lewis Temple. But again, from the perspective of whaling capital, what mattered were whales, not whalers. Melville likes, likens isolatos to a deputation led by anarchist Baron de Klutz to the French National Assembly in 1790 to show a world of support, people from all countries of the world, of all corners of the world, uh, in support of the French Revolution, just as they accompanied old Ahab in the Pequod to, the, to lay the world's grievances before that bar from which not very many of them ever come back. And then he introduces this character, Black Little Pip. He never did, um, i.e., he never did come back. Oh no, he went before, poor Alabama boy, on the grim Pequod's forecastle, ye shall ere long see him beating his tambourine, prelusive of the eternal time when sent for to the great quarter deck on high, he was bid strike in with angels and beat his tambourine in glory, called a coward here, hailed a hero there. So who is this Pip who is called a coward here and hailed a hero in the afterlife? Here he is in chapter 40 that I've just mentioned, Midnight Foxhole which is written as a, as a kind of a play. It's a written as a play complete with stage directions, um, and it's a labor process play. Um, the sailors call for Pip with his tambourine to play, uh, to play as they work. The group shouts, the squall, the squall, jump my jollies, they scatter. Pip shrinking under the wind, windlass, jollies, Lord, help such jollies, crish, crash, there goes the jib stay, blang, wang, god, duck, lower, Pip, 
white wall squalls they white squalls white whale sure sure here have i heard all the chat just now and the white whale sure sure but spoke but spoken of once and only this evening it makes me jingle all over like my tambourine that anaconda of an old man swarm to uh, swarm in to hunt him O oh, thou big white god aloft there somewhere in yon darkness, have mercy on this small black boy down here. Preserve him from all men that have no bowels to feel fear. That's Pip. The, narr the narrator calls him a uh, poor Alabama boy, although the book slowly shows that the Pip's origins are complex. He's also from Connecticut. Uh, he might have been blackbirded or kidnapped. Um, Michael Sawyer uh, argues that Pip is a slave on the Pequod and that what we see in Moby Dick is plantation slavery taking to the ocean. I agree that the catastrophe of the Middle Passage is in the background. Um, that's, that is the catastrophe that haunts this particular catastrophe of the ship in, in Doom. It's also where, um, where Pip falls that uh, is important, I'll, I'll come to that point. But where Pip falls is important for interpreting what it means, what his fall actually means. Okay, in chapter 93, the castaway, Pip falls into the water uh, and he's, he falls in once and he's warned by the racist Stubbs. He falls in a second time and Stubbs chases the whale and says, you know, um, he leaves him in the water, abandons him and he's changed forever. That scene is a crucial moment for Trinidadian communist C.L.R. James, who wrote a study uh, of Moby Dick called Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways, while interned on Ellis Island for four months in 1952. So he's interned on Ellis Island. He writes his book um, as a kind of demonstration of his commitment to America, although it's very subversive in all sorts of ways. It's a commitment to another America in many ways. James argues that Moby Dick speaks to mid-century U.S. and also uh, to the mid-century United States and also to Western civilization, in his words, because in Ahab, you have a figure driven by his conviction in material progress to the point of catastrophe. Um, and he precisely says, yeah, like a lot of other thinkers, in fact, like Amos Césaire, he says this is precisely what Nazism represented for Western civilization, a deadly pursuit of a uh, master race and a national economy, the twist that he adds, by any means necessary. And he warns that, that the USSR is on a similar path of ruin. He doesn't quite say that, of course, the US and uh, you know, capitalist, you know, imperial capitalist society, industrial society is also on a simple path of, similar path of ruin. But and he, saw, he thought Melville saw this um, inevitability a century earlier and through the figure of Ahab. So C.L.R. James reads Moby Dick as a treatise on the rise and fall of totalitarianism and of the cooptation of the energies of mariners, renegades, and castaways who might have produced something else. And that is where, again, Mar Margaret Cohen's argument is important for how those hopes are thwarted. Well, she'll be speaking next week. Um, but there's a crucial moment in which James argues Ahab is pulled in two directions. On the one hand, the dictator is pulled by his secret paramilitary force, uh, by, uh, led by a Parsi called Fadala, an Orientalist type, who uh, James likes, likens to evil, an evil, superstitious barbarian, again, an Orientalist form. On the other hand, Ahab is moved by the most debased seafarer, Pip, who after falling into the sea becomes, in, in his view, a, this, a Shakespearean figure, Lear's fool, the, the, the fool in King Lear who could speak back to, to the, whose mad ravings were the actual voice of reason. Michael Sawyer picks up on the argument about how Pip becomes a hero, and he does this by returning to the scene of the crime. Pip's fallen to the ocean. The first time he falls in, Stubbs rebukes him, stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord, I won't pick you up if you jump. Mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for, sell for 30 times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Sawyer reads this as a reminder that Pip is enslaved. But it could just as well be a warning that he could 
always be slow, sold into slavery. When he falls in again, Melville writes, the sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though, rather carried down alive to wondrous depths where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman wisdom revealed his hoarded heaps, and among the joyous, heartless, ever-juvenile eternity, Pip saw the multitudinous, God-omnipresent coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the, tr the treadle of the loom and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So how do we interpret this? Michael Sawyer reads Pip's rebirth through Orlando Patterson's notion of social death, the, the profound process of natal alienation that produced the isolated strangers required by the plantation system. We, when he falls in the, in the second time, in Sawyer's words, Pick experiences the retracing of the middle passage, disoriented from the horizontal to the vertical axis. It is the second death of the odd, already socially, already dead soul of Pip through descent into the depths of the ocean, the birth of the new Pip, and it is this death of the black horse soul of Pip that positions him to have a prescient form of being that is best understood as godlike. This is why he's cast as the idiot of the Pequod. But Lear's fool is inadequate to explain this transformation. There's still more to say about Pip's fall that requires returning to New England and the beginning of the book to an early scene in chapter 13 in which Queequeg and Ishmael notice how people stare at their intimacy on the ferry from New, ba New Bedford to Nantucket before they board the ship. So full of this reeling scene were we as we stood by the plunging bowsprit that for some time, we did not notice the jeering glances of the passengers, a lubber-like assembly who marveled that the two fellows be fellow beings should be so companionable, companionable as though a white man were anything more dignified than a whitewashed Negro. The implication may be here that Ishmael is mistaken for white rather than what he calls himself or calls a whitewashed Negro, a mixed race person who passes for white and then the question is, what is Queequeg mistaken for, if not a fugitive from the South? It's important to remember that this is the period of sustained black escape from slavery through the Underground Railroad and other means. The estimate is of about 1,000 people escaping slave states each year in the 1800s until the Civil War, or about 70,000 from 1800 to 1865. New England whaling was one receptive place for black men to find work. Melville wrote versions of Moby Dick during the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which brought the question of complicity, to slave, uh, of complicity with slavery squarely to the north. Fred Barnard argues that several people had complained about racial abuse on the Nantucket Ferry, including a young man who took the name Frederick Douglass. The, these episodes were written about in abolitionist uh, writings that Melville would certainly have read. Barnard argues that Melville casts Ahab as a solid bronze with a solid bronze with a tawny face. He was perhaps also a mixed race person, hell bent on destroying either the blackness or the whiteness of the whale. But this make this argument makes better sense in light of the structured hierarchies of humanities of humanity foisted on the whaling ship by the lay system and also by the surrounding frenzy prompted by the fugitive slave laws. There's a vast secondary literature on the whiteness of the whale in relation to notions of the sublime in, West, in the Western tradition with its con connotations of transcendence and repulsion and confrontation with nature. Margaret Cohen again argues for a, spe a specific sense of sub uh, the, the sublime at work that Moby Dick is sublime returning to the early modern parallel between the search for novelty on the part of the innovative artist or writer who resembles the vanguard navigator. But I wonder if in the sense of the oceanic sublime could have avoided the dread surrounding the navigation of fugitivity on the mainland in the 1840s, especially in the north. The historian Sven Beckert argues that there was wide agreement in the 19th century among both defenders and detractors of slavery that it was a national and not just the southern institution, that it included financiers and traders in Boston and New York, New England textile industrialists, 
as well as suppliers of finance and industrial goods flowing back into the expansion of, uh, of slave-based cotton farming of the Louisiana Purchase. In the aftermath of the Civil War, proponents of a national imagination of America as uniquely the bearer of human freedom had a very difficult time accounting for its long, centuries-long reliance on slavery. That's when it's retrospectively recast as a southern thing. Arguments about morality and business circulating in the cities of the North recur in Melville's imagination in the argument between the pragmatic first mate Starbuck, who is steadfastly focused on hunting whales for profit, and the narcissistic Ahab focused on his personal nemesis and whatever it, brought it, whatever it means in the broader context. Uh, there may have been personal reasons for Melville, that Melville felt the need to be circumspect about abolitionism. His father-in-law had been Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court and the only judge in the North to return a slave to the South. There is an incident that he uh, drew on from his time as, as a seafarer, which is very important, while gamming with another ship in 1841. That's when ships you know, come, across, come alongside each other and... Uh, on, the, on the high seas, Melville heard a story from the son of Owen Chase, first mate of the Essex, which was sunk by a whale in 1820. The white Nan Nantucketers, uh, uh, Nantucketers who survived that whale attack did so by eating the bodies of black sailors who died of malnutrition. Five of the six sailors who died were black, and Chase effectively silenced this aspect to write a heroic account of the survival of that death the Nantucketers from the Essex. If the fate of the Essex was the inspiration for Moby Dick, how would this racialized cannibalism have affected Melville? Fred Barnard puts it quite bluntly, a white killing ship owned and provisioned by Pacific Quakers, commanded by a possibly mulatto captain, whose fate is narrated by a likely mulatto seaman, pursuing black victims north within the time of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, opens directly onto the possibility that black whales heading northward in the bloodied and unpeaceful Pacific Ocean are Melville's metaphor for or parallel to fugitive slaves, that the violence done to whales reflects the violence done to slaves, and, the hated, and that the hated white whale suggests a black person who can pass for white. This might be overly literal, but perhaps creolization is the dreaded possibility that this oceanic sublime conceals. Melville perhaps knew that the, even the abolitionists in their midst might be infected by a fear of creolization, the actu actual possibility of a combination of mariners, renegades, and castaways. There's another possibility which holds a more guarded view on the aftermath of abolition, and this takes me to a set of minor characters, a confluence of, not minor characters, a minor confluence of figures, one fictional and two historical and connected to this uh, story. Okay, so at the bottom left is the, uh, we are seeing the thing on the edge, oh, oh well. <laughs> um, I wish I could get rid of that. The aesthetics of the of PowerPoint will never actually satisfy. Um, okay, so bottom left is Baltimore, Port of Baltimore, slave state of Maryland. The young Fred Bailey, top center, uh, was there 1835 to 38, hired out by his owners to William Gardner's shipyard to work as a ship's corker. He became part of black circles of debate, fell in love with a free black woman called Anna. In 1836, he was beaten up badly in Gardner's shipyard, a turning point in his own quest to escape slavery. This beating was witnessed by a fictional character, the fictional mulatto uh, freedman Zachary Ride. Apologies, a random uh, drawing from the internet of this fictional character, Zachary Ryan, from uh, Mithav Ghosh's um, Sea of Poppies, which is a, also an homage to Moby Dick in, in various moments. Zachary Ride uh, was shaken by this event. He joined another ship called the Ibis, also built in Gardner's shipyard for the illegal slave trade, now headed for the Indian Ocean. Zachary leaves with... Fre uh, with uh, but this, he says, Freddie's voice, he leaves with Freddie's voice not reproaching them for coming to his defense, but urging them to leave, scatter in the face, scatter in the face of white reprisals for the demand for black freedom. The Ibis in 
Amitabh Ghosh's Sea of Poppies took a ride, an idol called Ma Malum Zikri, by his Laskar crew into a new world of unfree labor in the Indian Ocean, where he tried to pass as white but remained haunted by his past. Meanwhile, Fred Bailey found his uh, way to Delaware and on to New York, where he's changed his name to Frederick Johnson. Anna left her home, I mean, she was, you know, she was, left her home and waged work to follow her articulate and penniless young lover to New York, where they married and moved on to New Bedford in 1838. They were, uh, they were advised to change their names. The Johnsons were, like, a lot, there were a lot of people who took the name Johnson, and that's when they became, that's when he became Frederick Douglass with an extra S for emphasis. Um, there's speculation about whether Douglas and Melville may have crossed paths in the same milieu. They would have observed New Bedford in its wailing heyday with a different, from different perspectives, different critical perspectives. In 1841, Douglas was part of a racially mixed delegation that experienced the segregation of zeal off the Nantucket Ferry on the, uh, 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 on the way to his first public speech. While becoming the important voice of abolitionism, Douglas also saw its limits, and he also saw what he thought was a new form of whiteness emerging in the late 19th century, or mid to late 19th century, as a point that, uh, that W.E.B. Du Bois picks up on, including the notion of the color line, which comes from Douglas, the notion of a color line spreading across the world with new forms of whiteness as property in space, in space and personhood. And color lines did indeed spread across the world, in the late 19th into the early 20th century, and the, beginning in the Indian Ocean where the Pequod was headed in pursuit of a white whale. We can read the first half of, this is a big claim, but I think we can read the first half of, the Moby, of Moby Dick in the Atlantic as laying out an industrial ocean shaped by linked uh, colonialisms, bringing the dispossessed of many lands and islands to the Pequod. But as the ship rounds the Cape, uh, the, the Cape of Good Hope, we see more of the ocean itself, including ocean monsters like the giant squid, hordes of sharks feeding on each other. Um, the hunt for the whale continues north, but the Pequod neatly avoids this part, the monsoon ocean with its uh, circuits of Islam and trade and convicts and indentured laborers. Sharn Lavery presciently argues that for about 50 chapters, the majority of the Pequod's journey is in the Indian Ocean. The appearance of Fadala brought in standard Orientalist ideas, but as Lavery puts it, while Melville's engagement with the Indian Ocean as an oceanographic region is extensive, as a geopolitical space, it is perfunctory. Whale ships were meant to be self-sufficient to remain on the sea for, seas for years, so perhaps the Pequod, in her words, has no need to make contact with the shore. But at the end, Lavery argues the North Pacific is an imperial aquanalis, an aquanalius in the book. The Indian Ocean is a structured absence. But it's also a template to rehearse the legacies of Atlantic slavery. That the scene of the shark massacre is one crucial point. So when Pip falls into the sea, he does so on the way out of the Indian Ocean into the Pacific, into the North Pacific. A bit later in chapter 99, Pip shouts, Caw, caw, ain't I crow? We might read this ain't I crow as an unca uncanny reference to Sojourner Truth in 1851, ain't I woman? But perhaps Melville has Pip referring to blackbirding. That's one reading. Gerald, uh, Gerald Horn shows that the end of slavery in the U.S. energized both the offshore spread of U.S. imperialism and the movement of a Confederate diaspora to the Pacific, to blackbirding off that is kidnapping of Kanakas, native people, many from the Solomon Islands and other islands, to racial plantations in Fiji, in Queensland, the Australian colonies. So a lot of the, 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 the figures, the, 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 the intermediaries of the, the, the involved in the slave trade move to where the Pequod is headed. Can we read Pip's madness as seeing into this future, beyond the threat of his own fate in the waters of the South Pacific, that the Pequod never reaches. Perhaps when he looks at the coral, he also sees another kind of threat in the destruction of ocean life. These possibilities take us beyond Melville to another reader of Moby Dick, who I've been wanting to get to all this while, who is Ellen Gallagher. So, Ellen Gallagher. Gallagher is a 
has been working for an, as an artist for um, the last 30 years or so on various kinds of work in uh, painting, drawing, also sculpture and film, often connecting race and gender, blackness, um, and the undersea. She comes from Rhode Island um, and is connected by ancestry to migrants from Cape Verde in large part through, or significant part, through, the whale, through whaling ships. She spent a summer working on a fishing boat in Alaska, and at the age of 20, she spent a semester on an oceanographic ship researching the migration of pteropods, the microscopic wing-footed snails. Uh, she spent parts of her days drawing these wing-footed snails. She reads a lot. She's inspired by Moby Dick. She says, I, th I think it's an Afrofuturist text, and she draws inspiration also from De Detroit Electronica, um, from the Detroit Electronica group Drexia, as well as Sun Ra. And I'd like to show a bit of uh, documentary. Oh, where'd that go? What's the problem with... I've got... I've gone to someone's mail somehow. Okay, that's not what I want. Where did it go? That's my dog. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. I know, I may have closed this. Uh, this gives a second of a of some water. So I'm going to play um, a bit of a documentary um, by Resonant Advisor called Why Drexia Took Detroit Electro Underwater. And uh, all will become clear, <laughs> or something. Three X, please use extra caution as you pass the awful construction site on the side of the awful line. I repeat, proceed with caution. Drexia, the duo of James Stinson and Gerald Donald were the most important electro artists of the 90s. As part of the underground resistance crew, they helped pioneer a harder Detroit-focused strain of the genre. But where their fellow Detroiters looked to outer space for inspiration, Drexia went under the sea. of Drexia was first explained in the liner notes of a compilation called The Quest. The notes describe pregnant African slaves thrown overboard on their voyage to America after they were deemed ill and disruptive. The women ended up giving birth to babies that never needed air, leading to the creation of the Drexian tribes who advanced far beyond the human race. I want to do something that involved a total concept and take people somewhere else instead of giving them the same thing that they see every single day when they step outside the door. Donald and Stinson lived in Detroit, a technology obsessed city that was in decay. You know, there's a lot of rough characters in Detroit. From top to bottom and left to right, we begin to create what you think the world should be, what you think life should be for everyone else. And I think it developed from that. The duo tapped into a school of thought called Afrofuturism, which goes all the way back to Samra's early days in the 1950s. The music is different here, not like Planet Earth. Samra created a cosmic persona for himself, claiming to not only be from the future, but outer space. We set up a colony for black people here. See what they can do on planet all their own without any white people there. These Afrofuturist themes coursed through black music in the 70s. From the jazz experiments of Miles Davis and Alice Coltrane to the space out dub reggae of Lee Scratch Perry, the electronic funk of George Clinton. It's a very strong belief that we're not from here, that we're from the planet Sirius in the constellation of Orion. If you are Afro-American and you're in a country where your relatives were not able to practice you know, the culture where they were from, because they were slaves brought them from Africa, you adapt in other ways. You recreate your universe. It was done a long time ago out of necessity to stay sane in an insane world. As with other artists before them, 
Stinson and Donald dealt with the trauma and despair of black history and black life by imagining an alternate future. But as part of a new generation gripped by the expansion of electronic music, the sound of Afrofuturism evolved. The early 80s was a critical moment to me at least to experience the whole field of electronic music. The increasing availability of electronic instruments drove this music in a technology-focused, futuristic direction. Drawing inspiration from groups like Yellow Magic Orchestra and Kraftwerk, 80s electro and hip-hop evolved, fusing tales of black life with electronic beats and synths. While producers like Egyptian Lover borrowed vocodes from Italo Disco to sound even more robotic, I think maybe a lot of the electro in the past, you may have had, you know, artists that deep down they wanted to be R&B stars, whereas direction was like in the opposite direction. Drexia made electro that sounded more futuristic than anything before it. and rough bass lines reflected the awesome power of water, imitating sea spray and the thrust of tidal waves. The duo fleshed out this underwater world through track titles, label artwork, and occasional spoken word. These were aquatic people who lived in the bubble metropolis. They rode on the aquaban and performed aqua jiu-jitsu. Over the course of eight albums known as the Storm series, the duo pieced together a vivid history of Drexia. Okay, so that's Drexia. Stinson and Donald were anonymous for many years. They never performed live. They were uh, they they had events with uh, with very little notice. They they performed under various aliases. Uh, they were uh, invented a kind of black aqua futurism from the Detroit underground, but not off it. They were fiercely anti-commercial. They refused big labels, concerts, tours. And uh, Stinson was, uh, for some time, a long-distance trucker. Perhaps in traversing the length and breadth of the US, he imagined traveling the Aquaban, performing aqua jiu-jitsu. Catherine McKittrick argues that Drexia offers anonymity as method and critique and a moment of relief from the sub various surveillance systems that mark and make and weigh down black life. In a rare interview, Stinson says, the basic idea is being spontaneous. Load up the equipment and start working. There's nothing planned, no set course. The mystery of the unknown is basically what makes us tick. It's like living on the edge with it. He describes Dexia albums as storms emerging in different places through work with different labels and different, um, and, and, uh, different kinds of interventions. Then there's that foundering submarine myth in the liner notes to the 97, the quest of pregnant African slaves thrown overboard, babies born underwater, adapting, breathing liquid oxygen. Drexians seem to answer Edouard Glissant's call that peoples who have been, been to the abyss do not brag of being chosen. They live relation and clear the way for it to the extent that the oblivion of the abyss comes to them and that consequently their memory intensifies. Catherine McKittrick puts it precisely, the cosmo cosmogony in the liner notes of the quest provide a legible neo-slave narrative that promises a future, but the future, as we know, has not arrived. We are still waiting. She sees the promise of Drexia not in a call for an Afro-future aquatopia, but instead as collaborative sound labor that draws attention to creative acts that disrupt disciplined ways of knowing. 
She also comments on Drexia's use of the synthesizer, which can imitate different instruments. So the moment of synthesization is about collaboration, borrowing, sharing, uh, removing, and rewriting. And as they played live into a pre-digital analog recorder, what we are given as listeners is synthesized improvisation. They harness the storm and let it go. And then McKittrick says, that's what Gallagher does. She storms us. But in fact, so does Catherine McKittrick, and so does Herman Melville. I'm going to show you a few images from Gallagher's 2018 solo show, Accidental Records. In fact, I have a copy of it, and I'm going to pass the catalog, which I'll pass around as well. But I'll show you images up here in case you can't see them from where you are. Um, and I'll also show you some images from a show in London um, called In the Black Fantastic. There is a slideshow online of Accidental Records. There's In the Black Fantastic has a wonderful YouTube walkabout with the curator. Okay, so Gallagher has, uh, has worked for many years with very, various elements of Moby Dick in sculpture and painting, including in Whale Fall. She writes about beginning a painting with the grid that underlies and informs what is to come, like the marine charts in the early part of the Pequod's journey. When Gallagher, Gallagher begins to paint, she sometimes builds a frame below the canvas so that she can glue, draw, and color elements. She covers the canvas with sheets of blue paper, collaged irregularly, then redraws lines over them. Um, sometimes she uses blue-lined paper, blurring it, liquefying it with watercolor, transforming the materiality of the work. The viewer is then taken in and out of the surface as if to challenge the chart and the compass to leave us literally in uncharted waters where ship and whale meet. In whale falls, other ships seem to rush in, but the color palette does not immediately clarify that this is a catastrophe. The grid of mastery persists, but there are multiple possibilities. I'm reminded of chapter 87 in Moby Dick, the Grand Armada, in which whalers are stunned into silently watching whales nursing their calves. It's a very differently gendered scene than much else in Moby Dick. Aqua Jujutsu, reference to Drexia, it's unlike the divers in that video. It's, uh, is it two figures intertwined? or a face looking out from a liquid grid. The sharpness of the black forms conveys something bold, but it's not clearly martial. It's not clearly human. Um, and that we see that, that attentiveness in some of our other works, that attentiveness to the non-human. Um, she made a series of pieces um, after reading uh, Philip Hoare's Leviathan, this 2020, 2010 watery ecstatic whale fall, uh, Gallagher stares with the whale ca carcass as it slowly descends to the ocean floor where it feeds a large number of organisms. Um, Philip Hoare responds to this, th 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 these images. He says, uh, men deconstructed whales for their own purposes to yield oil, heat, and light from animals that lived in the cold, dark depths. The human thirst for energy has resulted in a changed climate the dead whale seems to repair it. There's something angelic in this fall into the darkness. Um, I'll come back to that point that, that he makes. Okay, but I also wonder if the nat detailed naturalistic drawing, keeping in mind the young 20-year-old Ellen Gallagher right, uh, drawing those uh, wing-footed snails. <laughs> um, I, I think about a tradition of, of women naturalists on ships, a very old and marginal but important tradition um, of, and the distinctive art of women naturalists. Um, the, the, the ibis in, the, in um, Amitav Ghosh's trilogy also includes uh, women naturalists. Um, Maria Sibelia uh, uh, Marianne tried to capture insects in the process of transformation in these images. Um, so Philip Hoare says there's something angelic about the fall, but it's an angelic fall. Whoops, I'm not there yet. Angelic fall that takes us back to Pip in Pip's fall into the ocean, on which Gallagher says, it's like he's held up by these phantasmagoric terrors, the terror of drowning, the terror of the below you can't see. It's this portrait of the, of the middle passage. His body has survived, but his mind has not. Gallagher helps us see Pip's descent and partial rebirth in counterpoint to Ishmael's survival in a coffin text he cannot read. There's a specific relation of the drowned and the saved, or the partially drowned and the partially saved, um, that enables 
the narrator's oceanic speculation in the book that survives that catastrophe. But it's always punctuated by Pip's madness. Gallagher's paintings help us also, if I can do this. How do I hit? Oh, there. Gallagher's, I don't know if you can see it. Gallagher's paintings help us reconsider what Pip, Pip might see in his madness. In this piece from Watery Ecstatic, we can see what she, why she calls her practice a version of scrimshaw, the carvings seafarers made on, on whalebone. And we can see what Catherine McKittrick notes in Gallagher's use of humanoid faces embedded within the leaves of sea plants. This is Catherine McKittrick. Humanoid faces embedded within the leaves of sea plants. She draws attention to underwater life, plants, shells, seaweed, scales, watery circles that are relational to the few almost humanoids she details in her work. Her undersea drexians are constituted by, part of, within, fused with, and in relation to non-human underwater life forms. I like to think of this as what Pip might see, an enslaved figure who has already survived catastrophe several times. Um, in this series, Ecstatic Draft of Fishes from 2019, 2020, 2021, the pandemic period, oh, we're not over it yet, I know. Uh, we see these playful, otherworldly Drexians uh, figures we cannot exactly know. There's some kind of uh, s seeming, they, they seem sort of alien, they seem, uh, seem unknowable. Figures we can't know among the teeming life of the sea. Historian Robin Kelly, who has been writing about uh, Gallagher for quite some time, reflects back on some of her early Drexia-inspired work to say that what he had missed were the artistic elements, whoops, uh, he had missed uh, sorry, artistic elements that mirror the regenerative qualities of coral. And you see some of that here. Um, or the interdependent life forms of the sea, mollusks, crustaceans, exotic seaweed, uh, the tentacles of jellyfish. And yet, despite the powerful elegance of these life forms, regeneration does not occur outside of history. These are the bones of disembodied Africans, conscripts for the fields and factories, black bodies cannibalized by racial capitalism and its scientific jaws. Even in the realm of myth, um, modernity never leaves her sights. Drexia is not utopia, it blooms under siege, which is precisely why regeneration is so essential. Perhaps in our imperiled time, that is the right metaphor for reading the speculative excess throughout the journey of the Pequod, which is actually in the same color palette as these uh, paintings, it blooms under siege. That's my last. Thank you. Question. <laughs> Hi. As I was walking in the door, I heard you say that there's a percentage of um, Africans who are enslaved that are not Africans. Do you have a percentage? Yes. What was that percentage? I'm to look back at what I said. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth did I say? Um, Way back, like 11 I know, I know. <laughs> I know. I know I said it. And I do, uh, yeah, let's see. The problem of going digital, you know? Where are these things anymore? So no, So they would 
uh, their jobs were cheap. And so they would under, under, undercut Americans. And um, so I think one of the leaders of the fighter tavern, and he was the first one shot. And so that's a really famous Mm. That's on my, that my. You can see it in um, uh, Black Patriots. <coughs> 20 percent between 1800 and 1860. Significant. 20 percent. 20 percent. Thank you. I'd like to say in uh, modern day sailing lore, it's common reference to a large community of Americans in New England who largely came from Cape Verde yeah. as whalers and stayed there and you know grew a community. Yes. And and I have been to Cape Verde and I met uh, Americans from New England who came back to uh, Cape Verde to live and, and work and have small businesses who are from that community. Mm -hmm. And I saw the cash on the way. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Ellen Yager is looking at this at, as the book, as Oxford Futurism. Um, I'm, I'm so interested in how she's that story that is it Drexia? Yes. About uh, pregnant women being thrown overboard yes. and, and everything. Can you just speak a, a little bit more about that connection that maybe means. between like like Pip and because I'm seeing now I'm seeing like, oh, Pip is like Pip is crucial. This character that can yeah. see, you know, maybe these people that have been thrown overboard and he sees that world. And I mean, do you think that Pip, in, in your opinion, how do you think about him? Uh, would want to return to that world, even though it drove him mad. There, there's something that when he was in the sea, he was all alone, experiencing, like kind of had this an autonomy that he didn't have any place else. I'm just wondering, maybe if you could speak to that. There are lots of elements here. So first of all, I think you know any kind of work of art, uh, you know, we uh, speaks to us in different ways at different times. So right, so that's crucial. So this speaks to us in a different way today, given where you know we have our contemporary moment. Secondly, uh, how these characters work as characters is beguiling in this book, right? They're partly they're these interconnected figures and and there are archetypes that are evolving, but they're also our strong characters and what we make of them and the the, the, the main ones I think is up to. You know, there's there's room to step in, which is why this work survives and is so exciting, right? So what we I would sort of turn it around, and I think that's what she does as an artist. She, you know, she's so interesting to me that she she is she's she's she says she's the reading is a very important part of her practice, even though what she produces is not narrative, um, and it's not you know it's not written word, different form of of representation. Uh, the, what Pip is doing, all these black thinkers who I've raised uh, have different answers to the question what Pip, what Pip means, what Pip's fall into the ocean means, what Pip sees, what that means for us. It, it's different. For C.L.R. James, in, uh, mid, mid, uh, uh, you know, uh, mid 20th century, he says Melville saw the totalitarian kind of impulse that is, of course, you know, we see it everywhere today. But uh, so, in that sense, that reading is still important. Uh, Pip um, is important for Melville as well. I mean, sorry, for uh, C.L.R. James as well, as this kind. Of, he's and, and C.L.R. James was obsessed with Shakespeare, so he's. It's not surprising that he reads it as a, as this kind of as Lear's fool, as the figure who goes mad and sees, sees the insanity of this totalitarianism. But now we are also somewhere else. That's obviously still you know, useful as a reading. It still moves us. Um, but something else also, that, 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 you know, I, said, I, I said two things. I also am responding to my uh, dear 
comrade, Michael Sawyer, who has written a wonderful paper in a new companion on on Mel on uh, Moby Dick, on Pippin, on these these issues, and his argument is that that the, the, the shipwreck is a crucial figure in modernity, and um, the shipwreck, the wreck of the Pequod, is haunted by the long shipwreck that is the Middle Passage, and um, and that Pip is a, a Pip signifies the the ongoing plantation, the plantation in the ocean. I try to historicize that in a way. I say, well, this ma this voyage is actually kind of interesting because what happens after the end of the slave trade, all those parts, all those elements employed in the slave trade are still operable in different ways. The ship, the Ibis, the fictional ship, is a former slave ship, repurposed for indentured labor and then for other things, convicts and opium. Um, Zachary Ride from the Sea of Poppies, bigger escapes. There, there are continuities in all sorts of ways, in the capital, in the personnel, in the in the kinds of technology. And then and then maybe, you know, when we see that so so uh, uh, you know, had the people had gone here, he, they would have had to question the centrality of the, the, their assumptions about the Atlantic slave trade being generally applicable to the world. That would have to be questioned. You read the historians and what people working in this region will say slavery is a much more volatile and a much more nonlinear thing in this whole region. The people goes around it, but even so, it perhaps, <laughs> I think, not the real Pip, not the character, but what we can read in Pip, Pip's madness, maybe given the location of the Pip's fall and re rebirth, is, uh, is, a, is something about the continuing forms of unfree labor, uh, continuing forms of unfreedom on the high seas. Maybe he sees that. Maybe he can be seen to see that. <laughs> you know, the, the character himself is... Uh, young boy, it's what the interpretation of that event is. And then maybe also did that little bit in Melville, you know, he also sees the coral and he's, there's a kind of this angelic fall. Maybe he sees the climate crisis, maybe he sees, maybe, maybe that's another element that returns in Ellen Gallagher's way of seeing. Ellen Ga Ella Gallagher is, you know, really trying to think in these works about the kind of uh, both the loss uh, and the regenerative possibilities. That's another element in her work that this historian Robin Kelly sees her doing. So there's loss and regeneration at work in her Drexiology. <laughs> her Drexia is about rebirth as well. Well, you know, it's interesting because the only two, there's so many characters that aren't mentioned in the book. There's no women in the book, basically. Barely mentioned, but the two children in the book. So Pip is a child, and then the other child, I would argue, is um, the on the Rachel, where the captain has lost his son, oh, yeah. and so he's lost his child overboard. So it's interesting. You're talking about like regeneration, rebirth. Yes. The the two youngest, you know, the the future. The only two children in the book are both drowned and lost at sea. Yes, it's kind of interesting. Like there is no future. Our, our children are all drowning. Yes, and then there's the wave. The, 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 there's that uh, nursing of the whales. That moment as well. The whale, that relationship between humans and whales, and that question of reproductive reproduction and sort of yeah. There's there's a there's a lot to work yeah. with there too. It's true. Okay. Sorry. Well, so, well, since you were talking about the Grand Armada, yes, I wanted to go back to. I mean, so thank you. For for, for an amazing talk and just really um, so incredible, uh, you know, how you brought together Drexia, which I was really thrilled to discover, it was also showing us Ellen Gallagher. So mm -hmm. I just thank you for putting, all, putting that all together. Um, and I'm wondering about the Grand Armada chapter and yeah. its location to come back to the question. Like, there, there's these two really extraordinary underwater moments. One is Pip and that vision that, you, yes. that you're referencing, and then looking into the depths in, in, in the Grand Armada. Yes, and, and that's situated 
at the junction of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific and the Straits of Malacca, and they, they get in there, they're being chased by pirates. Is that also where the Banner Man is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're being chased by pirates, yeah. and then that, that it kind of leads yeah. into the moment with um, this cessation of the hunting, and you know, Starbuck yes. is scratching the whale, yes. you know, that's extraordinary. So I was just wondering what yeah. you thought about the location of the Grand Armada, you know, and, and that point of juncture and, you know, it's, it's social because yes. he's, it's, he, and he says the whales have all gone in there to take refuge from the humans and maybe if they hang out together, yes. they'll be um, uh, a kind of more, um, more be able to protect each other. And so it's like they've all withdrawn to that space. Yeah. And in fact, they are, they are better able to resist the hunters. Amazing observation, thank you. I mean, I, I, you know, I stumbled into. Look, I, I'm not a Melville scholar, although I think I'm one of you. After, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, you know, and I go to an abstract, like knowing what, not knowing what I'm going to say, but which we always do, but it really was the case this time. And I stumbled into thinking, despite being a journey, thinking geographically about the journey and what appears where and what one can make of that. And I really need to think about that. That's actually, because the, the question, if the question of Pip's fall is also pretty much in that region, that is the other moment when we see the sublime. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing not to say. <laughs> yes, Lord. Um, yeah. I have to think about this. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Up there. Well, I had a thought when you were showing the beginning of the Garcia documentary, there's this wonderful framing um, of the Detroit group at this at this moment of industrial collapse, despair. Yes. Um, yes, 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 yes. And yes. this chart uh, makes me think similarly that at this key moment, Yes. A black figure leaves an industrial um, voyage that's going to ensure an anonymous death. And instead, uh, by going overboard, cements that as a major figure suddenly. Now it suddenly could become pivotal and has a journey that otherwise it would be a subservient goal. And so I wonder if that, that plunge into the sublime, that into the into the natural world yes. is in some way uh, what yes. Drexia is also going for because they say like I want to take people out of what they see what they see every day the horror of the everyday yeah. to a larger horror but a larger world as well yeah they, they, they Drexia tries so hard not to cite Detroit but of course it is a post-industrial kind of post-American, post-industrial, post-terrestrial, <laughs> um, and it's interesting, I did, I did so also st stumble on this hunch that we see the industrial ocean in that part of the book, first half of the book, and then maybe it, maybe the, I mean, in this part of the book, these 50 chapters are long, I think the book does, it, it makes, it uses the ocean as a, as a cipher to think about the aftermath of various things, maybe also the aftermath of industrialism in a certain way. We, we should be reading that today. That's true in our current catastrophe, of you know, many, many, many huge catastrophe. That is part of the catastrophe we read. Yeah, a post-industrial ocean emerges maybe in, 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 in this kind of cycle. And then the, the racialized, uh, question, and maybe that's when it was state of Malachi. It's important for the possibility of regeneration. For stretching, but it's, yeah, it's true. I think it's useful. Thank you. So my, my mind is now swirling around, too, with all of this, this Moby Dick, but I wanted the Tracy yes. too, for the top. Thank you. I mean, it was really, it was really wonderful, and you're bringing so much to this novel, uh, which I know really well, but this is all such new material. I want to know where you got that image before I even say what I wanted to say. It's so wonderful. Where is it from? 
Oh God, this is this is when we should cut the <laughs> before, before I lose my. Uh, I know. I, I actually have that image on my door. It was created. Um, I, I, think, I believe by Mystic Seaport during one of their uh, movie day oh, readings. Right. Oh, okay. it's yeah, it's a great image. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, so this is kind of random thoughts, and it goes back to the Grand Armada, yeah. which I really think is kind of the, just possibly the best chapter in Moby Dick, which yeah. is filled with them. And I thought about it uh, along with the sque a squeeze of the hand. Uh, as it's other, you know, these are kind of paired chapters yeah. for me because the hierarchy, the racial hierarchy, the, the uh, you know, military, or uh, just the hierarchy of the captain and the first mate and the second mate and the third mate, etc. Yes. In these two scenes, that's kind of dissolved. Yes. So in a squeeze of the hand, all these men are gathered around this big giant tub of sperm oil, yes. which is, and they're supposed to squeeze the glob, you know, the globules yes. of, of sperm out. And Ishmael says, you know, we, we couldn't, it was so gentle and so soft that we couldn't tell when we were squeezing the oil and when we were squeezing each other's hands. And it got to the point where we would look in each other's eyes. I mean, I, you know, I, I read it less as a frenzy, but that they're looking at one another with love yeah. and saying, can't we just squeeze sperm forever? <laughs> just the, and then the Grand Armada, yeah. when these men are all entranced yeah. by the view of the nursing calves and whale amours in the deep. So they're watching the, the, the whales have sex and then producing... Yeah. So it's another extremely, you know, it's it's a renewal almost literally with the sperm and the and the milk and the and the sex. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, these are two spots in which it seems as if some kind of coming together yeah. is possible, and you know, I don't know if that's you know if that's kind of a um, a reading of Moby Dick that's too, I don't know, idealistic or something. It's not meant to. You know, to wipe out the other, but they are two striking chapters yeah. in that book. They seem to be Melville seems to have set them apart as kind of two little gems. And you know, just this is another random observation, but yeah. I think I think Melville makes of the sea, the surface of the sea, a kind of skin. It's a big theme of skin through that novel, and and sometimes you know you can you can punch through the skin and see what's underneath. Uh, you get this clarity. And sometimes, as with Pip, you get a different type of clarity. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, maybe that's too random even to try to put together to make coherent. But it's, just, I guess, you know, these scenes are a sort of revelation yeah. where skin disappears and you have access to this, you know, this sublime uh, interior of the earth and of the human community. Now, when you said that, I immediately thought of uh, Gallagher's challenge in reading Moby Dick and thinking with it as she paints and works around the beginning with the surface and trying to think about depth and, and texture and liquidity and, and, uh, and you know, dealing with the deeper issues, the yes, S-word. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the question of sexuality. Of course, the question of race and sexuality are always twinned. Yeah. So, you know, that these questions of regeneration uh, and thinking from today, the kind of, you know, I'd say Philip Hoare's kind of gay hope, which is <laughs> confounded quickly, intentionally. Uh, and then, then, then something else that emerges, which is, about regeneration and maybe a more broadly ecological sense. What's being regenerated is the question in, a, in this chase from this uh, escape, attempted escape from the fugitive, from fugitivity itself maybe, escape from the US, escape yeah. from the, 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 the North's complicity with, uh, with slavery. There's a lot to think about there. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> You're closing us out. So, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, this, 
the observation of, of, about Gallagher and Drexia, I'm presuming that she, that much depends for her on pip meaning seed. Yeah. So I'm just going to sort of throw that out there. Uh, but but what I've really been thinking about uh, is the is the scene that that Pip conjures at the end of the doubloon, and he's imagining right uh, a scene that reaches back into his own past, right the wedding ring that's found in the tree that's that's discovered by I think maybe a a father or a grandfather figure, and then he's imagining forward, right some future moment when the Pequod, right, is, uh, is rediscovered, right, uh, and the doubloon is, is covered with oysters, whatever the image is, and it's, it's, it struck me tonight, uh, thank you, uh, that that's the deepest uh, scene, right, that has the, 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 the uh, most extensive uh, stretch backward and forward in time. I have to go back. I didn't actually bring my text to It's a meditation of the, ma of the, of yeah. the mast into the yeah, bloom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's likening it to this tree on a plantation. That's no. uh, so for whatever that's worth. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank Thanks, you everyone. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, our next lecture is going to be Tuesday, October 18th. It's gonna be here and it's uh, Margaret Cohen, who we've referenced and who's in the audience as well tonight. Uh, and she's going to be talking about the history of films inspired by Moby Dick uh, and show how filmmakers produce an enigmatic fantasy of whales and fragmented part, parts epitomized by their inscrutable eyes. She's also gonna talk a little bit about Jaws maybe, which is my favorite movie of all time, and that's where we got the poster idea from. Uh, I wanna thank everybody coming out tonight. I wanna to thank Paul, our superintendent, for getting that cable for me. Uh, Lauren, for staying here and working. Colin Dewey, for setting up these whole lectures. This is all his uh, bay child. And Darlene from the association. Uh, if you're not a member of the association, the association helps us. We could not do this without the association. There's no way. So thank you. Big round of applause for our <laughs> Chapter, but there's many, aren't you? I, I didn't actually sign up. I think I saved it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so sign up. There's lots of chapters available to read. And as Sean said, it's going to be a spectacular. Oh, and Wednesday. So the talk is Tuesday, and then Wednesday we're having the show at the Oasis for all you, as you said, Wednesday night partiers out there. That's going to be a very good time. There's information on the back there. Thank you so much for coming. If you have any questions, I have cards on the table, and just talk to me afterwards. And thank you again. <laughs>